Welcome to this Give Me 15 Minute Education Program for Medical Professionals. My name is Jennifer Sirfoss, and I'm the CEO of the Sirfoss Consulting Group. This presentation will address what you need to know about Medicare signature requirements. This session, along with many others, is available for free through iTunes as a podcast or as a video archive on YouTube. Learn more at scghealth.com. One quick legal note. None of the information contained in this presentation should be construed as legal advice. I encourage you to contact counsel if you have any questions regarding state or federal laws that apply to the concept covered during this session. With that, let's go ahead and get started with today's session on Medicare signature requirements. We're going to cover a number of things very quickly in the next 15 minutes. We're going to go over some of the best documentation practices, how to use an attestation statement, and also proven processes for you to properly obtain physician signatures. So let's start with what are the actual requirements from CMS. First off, what is the purpose of a physician signature? As I'm sure you're well aware, physician signatures should authenticate a document, but from a Medicare purpose, it's actually much more important. Instead, it's really an attestation about the services that were performed, and of course, the Medicare claim that's submitted is an invoice for those services. So in many ways, you have to think about the documents that are signed as being part of an overall bill for services to the, the federal government. And because of that, the signature is authenticating that the services that were performed are documented accurately and to the best level that you need to do they're reviewed by the physician, and they're authentic. Also, the physician is attesting that the services are medically necessary, that they are reasonable for that patient at that time, and that, yes, those services are truly what was performed, and it needs to be submitted for payment. This is, quite honestly, the industry standard for what a physician signature or other clinician signature to a medical chart stands for. Now, there's certain regulations and other national uh, coverage decisions or local coverage decisions that will supersede this interpretation. But generally, from a, just a, a regular standpoint of an average clinician, this is what a signature means. So with that, what's the actual things that you need to know when you get into Medicare? What, what are the nitty-gritty items? Well, the first thing for you to check out is the Program Integrity Manual. And this is really where you get into some of the do's and don'ts of working with the Medicare program. What it stipulates in Chapter 3, Section 3.3.2.4, is that a clinical signature needs to be handwritten or electronic. We'll talk a little bit about electronic signatures. Stamped signatures are not acceptable unless there needs to be something uh, that's accommodated under the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. So if there's an ADA accommodation because an individual can't write their own uh, signature, then a stamp may be appropriate. But with technology, quite honestly, at this point in time, stamp signatures in every instance are not acceptable. Signatures have to be legible. Just a quick note about that. In the state of Florida, they went so far as actually prescribing what a legible signature by a doctor means. So know, again, that there's a lot of question about what legible means. It needs to be done by the ordering and performing clinician. I'll talk a little bit about that. And it has to be done at the time of service or order, after the fact signatures are not appropriate. So if that's true, what else do you need to know? Well, you need to know that, at least from a hospital perspective, that the Joint Commission came out with their own requirements. So there's certain times where you're going to do a counter signature. And so it defines exactly what entries are going to require a counter signature on those. So again, if you're in a hospital setting, check out your Joint Commission requirements and talk to your compliance officer. You need to have an author for each entry that is identified. They need to then be authenticated by that author. And if you've got transcription or dictation entries, which again, most clinicians are going to have, that also needs to be authenticated by the author. Again, signature stamps are a problem. Electronic signatures really needs to be for one individual. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's quickly go over to one of the big things that I get a lot of questions about, which are incident to services or even split and shared services. So when a physician or other clinician is documenting incident to services, so this is where a physician or, let's say, a nurse practitioner are in the office, and there are services that are being performed incident to their own benefit. 
basically on behalf of, of their services. Um, so this could include um, other clinical information such as social history or family history. And again, the ancillary personnel, a nurse or a, a lab tech, is going to be grabbing some of that information. It may not be by the individual physician, but the information has to be reviewed by the physician that's going to uh, bill for the services, and they need to be authenticated. So you have to review it, read it, review it, make sure that it's true for that patient, and then that's what you're attesting to on your signature. Now, surgeries are a little different. So assistant in surgeries, assistant uh, signatures are not uh, actually re required. I always think it's a best practice. But when it comes down to it, if you're an assistant surgeon, or excuse me, an assistant at surgery, uh, the lead surgeon is the one that signs the documents, the, the medical chart, for being uh, complete and accurate. Now, on co-surgeon, because the billing is done under each of the surgeon's own numbers, that means that signatures are required on each of the notes. So if there's one co-opted note, both signatures are going to need to appear. What about scribes? There's more and more scribes happening today. And again, it's something that, that really has become a, a growing issue. So since scribes are not clinicians, they cannot sign for the physician. Instead, the physician, again, is going to review what the scribes put down, authenticate it, and then you're going to sign the clinical record. What I do think is a really good best practice, and again, what Medicare really asks for is that the scribe's name be included on the medical record, that this is a note taken by a scribe and, and lists their name. And again, uh, normal straightforward billing requirements, again, about the fact that this is a complete record of all of the services that were performed, that is uh, the same standard that would apply in instances with scribes. So electronic signatures, as we all know, growing, uh, changing the technology has made it now where you can sign with your finger on uh, iPhones. So electronic signatures really are becoming a, a great part of how we can authenticate medical records. However, this is the one thing I want to make sure everyone understands. Scribes still cannot sign for a physician. That review of the medical record and totality of everything that was documented needs to be reviewed and that individual clinician is going to review the information and then authenticate it and sign it. So that still is their responsibility. Double check your state laws. Also, I always think call your malpractice insurers and find out what they want. There's a number of different systems out there right now that have very different uh, aspects to them, different words that are used. So definitely talk to your malpractice insurer and see what best practices they're looking for. So eligible signatures. So here's what I can tell you. Um, every doctor I've worked with has probably the first letter that is somewhat able to be deciphered what that first letter is and the rest of it you can't read. Uh, quite honestly, that's even for my own signature quite true. And so because of that, there's two things that you can do. One is put the name of the physician underneath that signature so that, again, you can identify what that signature is. Or you could go to a signature log, which is a documented set of all of the clinician's signatures with their full name and, cr and credentials, and then you use that to match it back. Personally, I think on all of my documents, including super bills, go ahead and put the name of the practitioner at the bottom with the date information, and they can go ahead and do signatures. I am going to talk a little bit more about attestation, so we're going to come back to that one. But let's talk about no signature. OK, here is the biggest thing that I can tell you. From an attorney's perspective, as a lawyer, I cannot come up with any story for documentation that all of a sudden appears. So if a physician or other clinician forgets to sign something, you can't go back and sign it. Instead, we're going to talk about attestation. So if it's not signed, document that it wasn't signed and go for it. But let's say that it was dictated or transcribed and so you haven't reviewed and approved all of those things. That's understandable that there's going to be some lag. And so instead, you're going to go ahead and note on you know, the actual records that it was dictated and transcribed, some dates on that, and then the date when that was authenticated. Now, here's a note about orders. Orders have to be signed at the time of the order. Again, no retroactive. Now, if you're in a hospital setting and you have standing orders related to how you do your ordering and there's sort of a, a signature on file as part of it, Again, make sure that you are very strict with how you do that, because Medicare has made it very clear that orders have to have signature at the time of order. So let's move to attestation. So again, a doctor forgot to sign their actual 
um, their record, or in some instances they signed it but they forgot to date it. So instead what you can do is go back and have either a note with it or as part of the chart, let's say that it's a two-page deal and you can have note on the on rear of page, but include a statement, an attestation statement that identifies the name of the patient, the name of the beneficiary, some other number that goes with it. Make sure you identify the date of service. Then go in in that statement, identify the, the practitioner, and go ahead and have them sign and date with this attestation that, whoops, I forgot to sign it at the time of service or you know within a timely period. So you have that attestation regarding signatures. This is going to become a very big issue. The Office of the Inspector General has been noting that this is a bigger issue. There's been a number of things that have come out from Medicare about this. So I am anticipating as we move forward with audits that this is going to be an area of higher scrutiny for all of the Medicare audits. Dates on signatures. You know what? Somewhere on a medical claim, somewhere on a chart, there needs to be a date there anyhow. Best practice, go ahead and include it with the signature. Now, of course, on let's say a super bill where you have the date of the service that's performed at the top and then the signature at the bottom, that's fine. But again, in instances where you've got dictation happening or other transcription, it's very good uh, to establish having the date with the signature. And when it comes to electronic prescribing, there's a number of systems that actually will put the date as part of the electronic signature, which of course is, from my perspective, super awesome. So I've given you some examples uh, as part of the slides here. One of the notable things uh, from the Medicare, and this is actually a MedLearn article, so an MLN article, highly recommend you check it out. Uh, the first example here is an illegible signature, but there's a name at the bottom, and it says John Wig, MD. Make sure you have those credentials in there. And it has the squiggles. And you know what? The government says that's sufficient. What's not sufficient is to have the squiggles with no name anywhere on the page. So please make sure, again, best practices, just put the name all over everywhere and have, um, have the, the practitioner sign as part of that. So best practices, quickly I want to turn to some of the things that you can do. Again, as you're developing the forms in your office, it's really a best practice to have a policy about how you are going to do signatures in the office. Um, for electronic signatures and EMR, again, technology is changing. So make sure that you address it, because now today you can sign charts on your iPhone. That's something you want to do. There's a lot of issues that are a part of that. So how do you want to do these things? Have the discussion. AHIMA does have a free model policy if you want to check it out out on their website. I highly recommend that. Uh, we do have a full blog post on the SCG Health blog uh, that talks about signatures and has a number of links to these resources. Next best practice is part of that line that has the Nate as a practitioner. Make sure you include their credentials. And again, I'm a big fan of the electronic uh, signatures that includes the date and the time. Oh, it's just wonderful. If you can do it, why not? Double check again all the signature requirements on other documentation before you send it out. So let's say that there is an audit request that comes over for charts and you have signatures on there and it doesn't have a name on it. Guess what? Just send the, the signature log over with the uh, actual chart request that you're responding to. It's a big deal. Just do it. And then talk to your vendors as part of this, too. Again, it's a great opportunity to do outreach and a great opportunity to engage all of your vendor partners. What is not acceptable? Again, just let's close with that. Signed but not read. We can't do that. Signature on file. That is OK for your 1500s. It is not OK for anything else, including your super bills. And then my favorite one is this document has been electronically signed in the surgery department. Ooh, we have no idea, a generic surgery department. So those three things, just to close out, are not acceptable when you're looking at signatures. Again, you can have eligible signatures that have the name, the credential, and make me even more happy to the date and time. So with that, I want to close out and thank you very much for your attention today during this Give Me 15 Minute program. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. For those of you that are listening to the podcast or watching the video archive, please remember to rate this recording in iTunes or YouTube and to receive notices about upcoming Give Me 15 Minute programs or other education sessions, please sign up on scghealth.com. 
With that, thank you very much for joining me for this 15-minute education program. This concludes the presentation.